Coming up on Digital Music Trends 196, recorded on the 13th of August 2014, CZAC's new direction, the NAB opposes a review of the consent decrees, Pandora and Merlin strike a deal, a global street date on the horizon for music, Smule launches an artist-focused initiative, and we chat about distribution platforms for independent music. Hello everyone and welcome to Digital Music Trends, I'm Andrea Leonelli and this is the weekly show where we talk about and try to make sense of the latest news in the digital digital music industry and if you're watching or listening to the show on a streaming service remember that you can also uh, download it if you wish to uh, watch it on the go uh, as an audio or video podcast you can use Apple's podcast app downcast for iOS or dog catcher on Android and if you'd like to receive a weekly mail out that lets you know when the show is out and what we talk about each week you can sign up right from the homepage or go to bit.ly slash DMT list and this week it's a real pleasure to welcome back Emily White from Y Smith Entertainment a full service uh, talent management firm based in LA and New York, managing Brandon Benson, Future Monarchs, and Fo- Fox Stevenson, amongst others, uh, but also working in the sports and comedy space. So, hi, Emily, and thanks for joining me. How's it going? Great. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to have you. And it's also really great to welcome Kevin Wardis, uh, head of label services at Girly Action Media and Marketing, a full service uh, marketing agency offering a range of artists and project management services designed to create and promote music driven products and content. This is right from your website, but it was a little bit whew, hard to pronounce. So hi, Kevin, and thanks for joining me. How's it going? Hey, guys. Thanks for having me. <laughs> it's absolutely great to have you. And we'll talk uh, more about uh, what each of your company does uh, uh, through the show. Uh, but uh, I wanted to get started uh, uh, right from uh, the hardest topic of the day, I guess, which is uh, uh, talking about uh, CZAC. I want to talk about this last week, actually. It's the news that is about 10 days old, but I had uh, two uh, UK guests on the show, so I thought I'd better leave it to when I have uh, US guests on uh, that were probably more interested in this uh, particular so- topic. So essentially uh, what happened is that about 10 days ago, we got a raft of announcements uh, from uh, CZAC uh, uh, and uh, First of all, the, the society named John Josephson as its chairman and CEO, succeeding Stephen Swid, uh, who is chairman emeritus. And Johnson has been a director of the society for more than 20 years. Uh, and additionally, the society has decided to take three bold steps in order to increase its influence worldwide, which include expanding from representing only performance rights to multiple rights in numerous territories, expanding its services beyond publishers and songwriters to recording artists and labels, and acquiring music technology and micro-licensing uh, company Rumblefish, which was uh, an interesting uh, thing because I actually interviewed uh, Rumblefish on the show uh, just uh, a couple of weeks uh, back uh, on the one-to-one. And uh, so the press release go- goes on to explain that this is exp- expansion is possible because CZAC is independent and thus unregulated by the government uh, as opposed to ASCAP and BMI. So uh, CZAC is a for-profit organization which really sets it apart from other performing rights societies and it is outside of the, uh, of the uh, reviews that are happening at the moment with the Department of of justice so uh, you know a lot of stuff happening with CZAC uh, what do you make of that society from your perspective of course you're much more involved uh, uh, on this front in the US uh, uh, Emily uh, as opposed to ASCAP and BMI and uh, where does it fit in this debate uh, around rates Pandora and everything that's going on in the, on, on the performing uh, PRO's uh, uh, point of view Sure. Well, I think any of the three, you know, American tr- traditional PROs have to make a lot of moves. I mean, they're obviously in the press all of the time um, for new streaming rates and Pandora and, and everything like that. So it's really, really intense. Also with Irving Azoff starting a new PRO, right. which is going to compete with the U.S. PROs, um, obviously, you know, they need to make some moves. So I do think it's a good move to acquire Rumblefish. I think that's going to be great for a lot of up-and-coming writers and artists who are kind of overwhelmed by Sync World. So that's going to be great for them. Uh, You know, it doesn't really affect established artists too much. I don't envy the new CEO because that's just going to be an insane amount of work and and competition. But obviously they're up for it. They wouldn't have taken the job otherwise. And CSAC tends to be pretty popular internationally. I mean, they have a very small U.S. market share. So, you know, that's always been kind of why a lot of people want to work with them. So I I think, you know, adding Rumblefish is probably the most important out of those news and otherwise it's kind of enhancing what they've already done. Yeah, and what was interests me interests me is also wondering whether the fact that it's a, a much more unregulated society, whether it may attract the business of uh, uh, publishers that are currently with the other two that are much more regulated and that, that, that would be an interesting effect I think of this, uh, uh, of them 
separating themselves from the pack by saying that they're not they're not as regulated. Uh, Kevin, do you have any thoughts on on well, CZAC as 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 a, as a whole? I, I thought actually from a, a, a PR perspective that the, the message that's going out, the sort of the the big message, the whisper in all of that is the fact that they are private and unregulated. Yeah. And and I think that anyone who who reads past the headlines is going to realize that with this new landscape developing. Um, these societies are going to have to be incredibly nimble to survive, and and I think Irving Azoff is seeing this as well. That regulation is going to be difficult if it's boxing the other societies in, um, and so that's what raised my eyebrows. It's like interesting. Look, they can make moves, they can do acquisitions, they yeah. can go into corners that are still being sorted out uh, and different rates and and coming under different jurisdictions. Um, and I thought it was from um, from a marketing perspective an incredibly successful um, placement of information. Yeah, it was a nice little nugget that they created that distinction. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if anything, the 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 that nugget was uh, drowned out a little bit by the length of the statement because it announced a lot of things uh, all at once, which is always uh, uh, it always makes it difficult for journalists to pick out headlines on on how to position uh, the announcement as a whole, and they have to choose essentially one of the one of the points and and, and run with it. Uh, but uh, you know, th this is interesting also because uh, this week we heard that the uh, uh, U.S. National Association of Broadcasters uh, spoke out against the changes to the ASCAP and BMI consent decrees uh, uh, that are being considered by the Department of Justice. So ASCAP and BMI, uh, yes. of course, uh, are supporting a move towards publishers being able to pick and choose which services uh, uh, they license through the collective system. They also say that they should be able to li license mechanical rights as well as performing rights. And the NAB states that broadcasters, uh, you know, would be penal penalized by that because, uh, of course, uh, uh, they have to license all of the rights uh, and uh, uh, the fact that publishers could come out and, and actually create essentially their own PRO uh, would put them in a, in a position of disadvantage and then negotiations and would drive the rates up considerably and so uh, this is uh, kind of a back and forth that we've seen a lot uh, and uh, uh, there's also the argument of course that uh if uh, the big publishers were to take their digital catalog away from ASCAP and BMI, then independents would be left with uh, a much weaker hand to play when, negotiate, when negotiating rates. Uh, Emily, what do you make of that? Uh, you know, as a, somebody that works closely with independent artists, uh, do you feel like this it, it could be an issue if uh, you know Sony, ATV, and UMPG were to uh, essentially take all the digital rights out and do direct deals with Pandora? You know, it, it's really, really tough because to me there's a major difference between the major publishers and I tend to work with more independent publishers. Yeah. So, you know, I, I support on one hand what the PROs are doing because they're trying to protect their writers, but I also think they need to listen to some of the independent publishers. And yeah. if we can find a happy medium there, then it's a win. I mean, to be totally frank, like my artists make great livings through publishing and also through their PROs. So these are you know, entities that need to be working together. They are actually fighting for the right thing. You know, I, I do want to get plays on Pandora. We, we get nice sound exchange checks, but I think it is amazingly, even though it's 2014, still the wild, wild west out there. And everybody's kind of get, got to get along and figure out what makes sense. You yeah. know, I there's a, there's a lot of different viewpoints here. And I think if the PROs can really get along with the independent publishers, that's going to form a pretty strong arm where hopefully the major label publishers can make sense. I, I understand why publishers would want to go direct on this. Yeah. And I, I, I'm cool with that when it's people I can really communicate with. But if it's yeah. just going to get lost in a big catalog and writers and heirs are never going to see the revenue, then it's not really something I can support. Generally, the PROs know what they're doing, are really yeah. fighting for the writers, but so are publishers as well. So I just think if, I, I know it's hippie, but it's like if, if, if the PROs and publishers can come to the table and realize they're actually both representing songwriters, then... Yeah. Hopefully, some good can come from it and get along. Essentially, yes. yeah. Uh, Kevin, uh, on your front, of course, you, you work on on, on uh, different types of products uh, with with artists and, and labels. But uh, uh, do you feel like they are concerned about their uh, their publishing revenues and how uh, how these reforms may affect those? Some, some more than others. Um, yeah. I think that that um, and, and Emily sort of spoke to this. It's so convoluted. A lot of the work that that I personally do are self releases, um, and it's so com confusing and so convoluted and there's there's so many different revenue streams and so many companies raising their hand and saying that they can get this more than that and it becomes a lot of sort of white noise 
Um, and my sense of what I was thinking about when Emily was just chatting was, uh, I think that the more direct deals there are, the more fragmented all of this becomes, and the yeah. more confusing it becomes, um, and difficult it's going to be for artists, uh, for songwriters to get the best rates. The more if you go direct, um, there's a lot. You know, there's going to be non-disclosure, and it's going to be really difficult. And again, I think that that goes back to the sort of regulation issues yeah. is that if, if these societies are boxed in and they can't disclose or they, they're allowed to do certain things, it's just really confusing. And what needs to happen for the greater good is simplicity. Um, and um, I think some of the issues with Pandora, for instance, need to be sort of sorted out yeah. in order for us to figure out what the, what the landing strip is for artists Absolutely. to succeed. Absolutely. And an interesting thing that happened actually in the last few days is the fact that Merlin announced uh, uh, being, you know, the first essentially uh, industry body or label organization essentially that they represent uh, a lot of independence labels, uh, labels across the spectrum to strike a deal with Pandora. So this is super interesting because it kind of, uh, it's the first direct deal essentially that Pandora is doing with uh, with a rights holder. Uh, of course, they've, they've been paying their, their rights directly to Sound Exchange, And uh, it's not really, it, it doesn't, they haven't disclosed whether there were any uh, financial quid pro quos or any, any exchanging uh, of, of, of money that happened here. But essentially, the deal means that the labels that opt in uh, will be able to promote uh, their uh, music uh, much quicker on Pandora. It will be integrating the playlists uh, faster. Uh, artists will get more exposure, which in turn will uh, uh, you know mean that they will get more money from the service as their tracks are played more. And uh, there's also an, a bunch of different uh, uh, opportunities such such as uh, being able to access their data uh, or on what tracks have been played where, which is going to play into their touring uh, options and everything else. So a lot of interesting uh, things that are happening here, and uh, I definitely wouldn't have foreseen a deal happening between Merlin and Pandora. Uh, it's something that kind of took me by surprise. So uh, Kevin, uh, on that front, do you think that uh, this is a data, this is an opportunity that could really work into uh, artist strategies when it comes to uh, for example, figuring out uh, you know a direct fan campaign or anything like that, and trying to figure out where their fans are, and, and how can Pandora help on that front? Right. I haven't been following this um, in too much detail, so I can't speak to the details of it. But generally speaking, at, at any point that we can harvest data, yeah, Pandora theoretically is a trove of data. Exactly. It's pretty. It's 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 amazing, um, and it's invaluable, and it's and it can be more valuable and more uh, something that one can make more money from than the penny rate for streams. So to the extent that Pandora becomes a service, not just in terms of serving music, but communicating back to the rights holder about uh, consumption behavior and whether people are liking it and where and what time of day, um, I think that's fantastic. Yeah. What I, you know, it's what I love about the internet. There's so much more. You can keep peeling that onion and getting more and more information. So I think that's uh, an, an incredible move to sort of take that value set and rise it to the top yeah. um, and present it on equal par with the revenue. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it feels like, you know, I, I don't know, Emily, but I don't know how, how you felt about Pandora, but it felt like they had kind of had a, a lot of mixed messages last year around the artist community, especially independents. And, uh, you know, they were trying to rally artists uh, towards them when talking about uh, royalty rates and getting them to write to Congress uh, uh, about certain uh, certain bills and decisions. Uh, uh, but this feels like it's a, definitely a positive move towards uh, sort of gaining the confidence of the independent sector back. And, uh, you know, everybody's been waiting for Pandora to announce this opening up of the, of the data sets and the fact that they're doing it with independent labels in the first place is, is pretty encouraging, right? It is. I mean, I think we also need to look at the other side of the coin, which is right. fans love Pandora. It's very, very popular. So again, we need to make sense of it. It has confused me forever why they do not compensate publishers and writers in the same way that they compensate master holders. I understand that traditionally master holders, you know, might be more tough to get involved with a digital platform. But I think you know, in everything else, master publishing is 50-50, is and so I'd like yeah. to see it <laughs> even elsewhere. Um, that being said, there's great people at Pandora. They really want to share the amazing data that they're collecting. You know, I, I've seen some incredible things, you know, behind the scenes things that they're working on, but they also need to protect the privacy of their users. So they're really trying to strike a fine balance where they can give artists, managers, labels, some incredible information on where users, users users are at, but also 
protect you know their actual customers so yeah. it's 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 constantly a balance but I, i'd like to see you know writers more compensated because there's ads there's ad revenue and a great ad team over there so you know it, it, it they need to start paying writers fairly. Yes, absolutely. And, uh, uh, you know, it's, uh, there's actually an interesting interview uh, that I recorded with Eric Wieschke uh, at South by this year uh, uh, with Pandora that you can find on youtube.com slash digital music trends uh, where he talks a lot about the data side of things and it's, it's a fascinating uh, topic. Uh, sorry, Kevin, you were saying? Well, I was wondering, Emily, are you looking at, uh, at impressions on Pandora and plays on Pandora as akin to sinks? Is that why you're referencing the 50-50? No, split? I was on their advisory board, so I had access to all these different things that they want to make public. But again, they're just trying to figure out privacy rights. So I signed an NDA and I can't totally talk about what I saw. But it's a lot of great information that as artist managers, we would all love to have. And I think there's ways to do it where we can get that information, particularly on location. Yeah. Um, but not necessarily like expose who the users are. Because I, I think the one area that's really behind in technology in the industry is touring. And so I'm always looking for information on where fans are, where they're playing music. And um, I'd love to use that to drive drive touring and routing. Yeah. Right. But you, you made a, a reference that you th did you think that Pandora, that they should be play paying out publishers on a more equal yeah. level? Yeah. Masters? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Because it, 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 should, it should just be equal. Yeah, but on, on that front, do you think that because the, the big debate now is the fact that Pandora is not even profitable yet, and of course, there's no way that they're going to agree to paying publishers the same amount they pay. I really got to be careful, labels. but yeah, um, sure, of course. But like you know, the the idea here is that people are <laughs> well, people I've talked to, especially lawyers in the U.S., are saying, look, if publishers are to get a bigger share. Uh, labels are going to have to accept uh, a slight reduction in, in their rates right. in order for the publisher rate to go up because I right. mean the services are not profitable anyway so it's really difficult for them to just increase rates uh, overall there's revenue there right there's a lot of people there there's a lot of good parties there there's beautiful buildings so I'm just gonna plead the fifth and leave <laughs> <it> that. <laughs> absolutely absolutely and uh, actually uh, you know sticking to uh, talking about artist management and talking about mm -hmm. uh, interesting techniques and how things uh, are uh, you know what kind of uh, 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 what, what's helping artists to thrive and what mistakes artists are, are still making. This is something that uh, I, I was keen to talk to you both about. And so, uh, uh, Emily, starting with you, sort of what have you seen evolve over the last uh, sort of year or so uh, as far as uh, uh, things that work and things that don't work with independent artists in, in the U.S. and internationally? Uh, you know, what have you seen, uh, seen to be the most successful uh, uh, tactics to get your artists out there in the, in the, in the States and, uh, and abroad? Yeah, I mean, it, it kind of goes down to a relationship that's always existed that I wanted to comment on. And, right. you know, what what I've been seeing lately is sometimes artists that have been doing it for a while tend to try to rely on us as managers. What do you want us to do and where and what and why? But, I, you know, on the flip side, I've been really, really inspired lately by a handful of independent artists I've been working with, Emmeline Brodsky, Zoe Bookbinder, who come to me with their art and are like, here's the music video we're doing. Here's my album. Here's who I want to produce it. And that's been very, very inspiring. So a lot of artists I've seen, I've been seeing, and this is obviously like what I've worked in for a long time, um, with a traditional DIY attitude, it's been so inspiring and refreshing to me because they're taking advantage of how they can create their content anywhere. So um, I just wanted to remind artists that the more art you come up with, the more there is to work with. And of course, you want to make sure it's great. But um, that that's really the balance and what I've been seeing in artists lately. Too many are just coming to us and wanting to rely on us to tell them what to do. And we're pulling teeth to name albums or do photo shoots or create a assets. But then meanwhile, I'm being hit over the head in a good way by by some artists who are just so pumped about what they're doing. It's it's working and it's thriving because of it. It's been a very 50-50 partnership and, yeah. and that's that's where I work best. That's, that's great. And I think that that kind of, uh, Kevin, you might be able to echo Emily's sentiments in the sense that working on a lot of different types of campaigns and uh, working on a lot of direct to fan stuff as well and, or crowdfunding, uh, you know, I guess probably the most successful campaigns are the ones where there's a high input of the artist, especially when it comes to uh, different types of pledges or different types of, uh, of uh, bundles that they may offer their audience as opposed to stuff that is that, that you make up uh, completely on your own. I, I don't know. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? I mean, yeah, without question, the artists who are firmly in control, who understand the conversation they're having with their fans, um, 
I, I call them CEAs, chief executive artists. Yeah. <laughs> and because they 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 have that vision, um, they they're smart, they're they're experienced, they understand the conversation, they're good at delegating, but they're good at stepping in, um, and they also understand that the record is. Um, you know, maybe half of the equation and the other half is all of those satellite assets that Emily was just talking about. That's what you're giving your fans, those experiences and so on. Um, those are the fun projects to work on, frankly. Yeah. The ones where we have a uh, tradition, sort of more traditional old school artist, either literally or in mentality, that plunk the record down and, you know, yeah, ask us what they should name the record. Um, you can pretty much tell right away it's not going anywhere because there's that passion either exudes out of the project or um, or it doesn't. Yeah. Um, it's just more fun to work with the ones that have this incredible vision. Yeah. It's enormously fun. And, and Emily, we were talking with uh, Kevin in the prep about uh, distribution platforms and also different crowdfunding platforms that, and how they've evolved in the last 18 months. So uh, what would you say was like one company, the one company that you pick out uh, of the pack as uh, somebody that has, has evolved uh, considerably or that you've done uh, a lot of work with that you think uh, can be useful in, in the distribution side of things or in, in the connection between uh, fans and artists? Right. Well, yeah. as I mentioned before the broadcast, I'm particularly obsessed with Bandcamp. Right. Um, I always have been. I remember Ethan sitting across from me on a tour bus like six years ago or something. What do you want? What do you want me to build? Like saying this. And, you know, the platform is so seamless. And what I think is really interesting about it compared to pretty much everything else is if I start working with an artist and their music is anywhere or only one place, it's going to be Bandcamp. Yeah. So it makes sense to the artists. They understand the revenue. Yes. They're collecting email addresses. And, you know, on the flip side, Bandcamp is making, you know, bringing in $3 million a month. So it's working. And, and what Ethan is seeing is a lot of fans who are saying, I could only pay $5, but I wish I could pay 30 or a lot of people paying over what kind of the suggested price is. So yeah. the reason I wanted to talk about this in particular, I mean, most people know all of that is, again, I, you know, I, I have a few DIY artists who I'm either consulting or, or managing and, and helping um, to release their albums. And they were almost a little turned off by iTunes and, and digital retail. And I thought that was interesting because on one hand, they're right because I want to see the artist collecting data and having complete control, but they just don't think iTunes is very cool. You know, it's, it's kind relevant. of last decade. Yeah, it doesn't really make sense to them. So I think that when we're competing with free, which people forget all of the time, that we should also pay attention to what's working. So on one hand, I really believe in having our artist music absolutely everywhere. But I just think it's I, I think it's interesting how more and more of my artists like really just want to focus on Bandcamp and I kind of couldn't agree and support them more on that. Yeah. Yeah, and so how I think one of the things that um, I get asked about a lot is uh, how does uh, something like Bandcamp, for example, fit within uh, an ecosystem where somebody may be doing a pledge music campaign or a, an Indiegogo campaign to fund their album, and then <laughs> where does Bandcamp come into play? So uh, either Emily or Kevin, whoever wants to take that one, it'd be really interesting to hear your take on that. Well, I think Bandcamp. Go ahead. Sorry. Okay, I think you know Bandcamp. Um, on one hand, is a platform and a community, but also it is direct to consumer. So I think right. that's really, really exciting. And when you're talking about crowdfunding campaigns, you know, Pledge is moving more into kind of pre, they don't even want to be called crowdfunding. Yeah. Um, I know. And they're moving more into kind of focusing on pre orders. And when I think of Indiegogo, you know, it's not even necessarily just a music platform and Kickstarter as well. Anyone can do, well, not anyone. That's a whole another story of why I started a company. But um, anyone working in the creative arts can start a, a project on Kickstarter. So yeah. you could be funding a tour. You could be buying a van. You could be making a music video. There's a ton of things we do on these platforms that don't really have anything to do with selling music. So that's what we keep in mind when we're looking at the big picture strategy. Um, a lot of times when we do a crowdfunding campaign, yeah, the artist needs that money to make a music video or things like that. But I, I shouldn't have said the word need. They don't really need to make a music video. So it's also a marketing component that we're yeah. putting in there. Um, but when it comes to direct to fan and direct to consumer sales, if you're overwhelmed by that, uh, Bandcamp is the way to go. It's going to make sense to both artists and, and industry people who might not know their way around technology. Right. right. But I think that you know Bandcamp or any other platform, it, it, in conjunction with, say, a crowdfunding for a record, um, 
I, I think there's a lot to be said to staying off Bandcamp or any of the other platforms and keep what you're doing gated so that you can get that community in one place, be it Pledge or Kickstarter or wherever else. Um, otherwise, this, it's too disparate and it takes away from the offering that you might be doing with your crowd. Okay, so I, I disagree because yeah. we're pointing our fans at Bandcamp. I mean, we have crowdfunding campaigns that are part of the strategy that we roll out at different points, but right. that's what I'm saying is like, that's where we're pointing people also because that's where the artists want to be pointing people. I, mean, I think it's an interesting conversation. At what point do you keep things gated um, in, in, the, in the arc of a, of a campaign? Are you evergreen on, say, Bandcamp or do you want to place certain assets at certain times in, in different places? I think that it would dilute a campaign if the same product or the same music or the same experience was available somewhere else. I totally disagree. I'm not into gating at all. We try to make things really clear to fans. And when we're landing syncs and things like that, you know, it needs to be on iTunes. It needs to be on Spotify. It needs to be on RDO. So we don't want to miss a single fan. So that's why right. we're not so into gating. Right. But right. I, I guess like a... Uh, uh, when it comes to the run-up, for example, to a release, if you are doing a pledge campaign, then it makes sense, of course, to gate it to pledge until it's released, and then after that, I would imagine that's that, what I would. That's yeah. what I would. Argue. That's that's what you were arguing, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's very rare that we use crowdfunding specifically for pre-orders or albums. Right. I know there's a ton of people that are doing that, but it's just crowdfunding is like the sky's the limit. So there's also a million right. ways to do album campaigns. So for of course, yeah. you know, it's been our experience. We don't usually run pre-orders and things like that through pledges. Not that I'm against it, I'm all for it, um, but we just do it for other things, vinyl, touring, like I said. Cool. Right. That's interesting. Andrea, you, you, uh, you asked about other companies, and Emily brought up Bandcamp. Um, Noise Trade has been pretty impressive for me. Right. Uh, they've, they've sort of really raised the level of, of artists that they're working with. I think it's it must be expanding. I don't know the data because they're just bringing in incredible artists. Um, and that's another you know platform that's offering free. They're offering pretty good data. Um, we use noise trade all the time to just sort of, you know, initially launch something and get a new vibrant um, uh, email list. Yeah. And then people can donate some money and we're always sort of surprised at how much is in there. That's a secondary consideration, but sure. there it is. It's that tip jar or whatever they call it. Um, and that can go back in. But I did want to mention them as well as a company that I think is um, really kind of um, delivering. And initially when I heard about them, uh, it didn't seem, I don't remember them having really great sort of stature artists. Now, it's incredible stuff up there. Talking about fan engagement, one, one company that announced a pretty interesting uh, uh, new strategy is Smule. So Smule is a, is a gaming company that has a lot to do with music. They've got uh, some fantastic uh, games that have uh, really you know, brought it to a 20 million plus strong community. And uh, uh, now it's launched an artist program that aims to leverage that community to advance artists' careers. So uh, you know, the program will work directly with artists and their management teams. It will work with emerging and established acts and artists will have the opportunity to promote the music on their own uh, with their own fans uh, and also with uh, a smul the smule community at large which is uh, you know could expose them to a lot of new fans essentially so uh, this is an interesting evolution of the space because of course i i, I worked in the music gaming space before and uh, a lot of companies were trying to get users by leveraging artists in order to uh, you know reach their fan base whilst uh, smule has created a massive community and is actually just uh, helping artists get exposure to the community rather than using them to uh, gain m more traction. So, uh, you know, how, how would you feel about working with a, somebody like Smule on, on that level? And what do you think they can bring to the table, Kevin? Uh, that one had gone totally escaped me until Andrea, you sent me that link and I read about them and I was uh, sort of amazed and amused. And then as I read through the article, I couldn't believe the, the, the potential. I mean, at first it just seemed sort of fun, maybe even the gimmicky, the sort of the karaoke nature of it, yeah. but it, it's it's clearly working. I was sort of taken aback at at least some of the claims in the article um, about well, they sort of claimed responsibility for some pretty significant sales. Of course, I don't know what else was going on in that campaign, whether that claim was um, it was legitimate, but it seemed like a fun thing. I, I'd like to see it, see how people use it creatively. Yeah. Um, in the music space, I don't know, Emily. Have you? Are you aware of these guys at all? And have you I used am. This I think it's really awesome because it's particularly going to appeal to kind of like the under fifteen crowd. Like I was even at the airport yesterday and watching a kid on his laptop just 
playing piano, you know? So that might sound like a different planet to a lot of people, but it is so, so huge. And it's going to be, you know, on us as, as managers to explain this to our artists. It's like, I would love to do a deal with them where people could collaborate oh. with Brendan Benson. Yeah. This isn't going to make sense to Brendan at all, but creating music in your basement and doing it on your own will. So how do we combine those young users where this is really, really second nature to some established artists yeah. are some cool things we could do with that community. Yeah. No, it's a, I think it's a really exciting platform. And, uh, you know, there's been so many companies that have tried to break that space and Smule have kind of gone the other way around it, creating fantastic games that created engagement, and then started actually uh, in including uh, more popular tracks uh, as part of those. And so, uh, yeah. actually, I missed out to say that the company's inaugural label partner is Bright Antenna, a home of bands like Flag Flagship, The One Bath, Beware of Darkness, and Flagship will release three songs on, on Smule's catalog. So, uh, we'll see how that goes, and definitely we'll keep an eye on the effects of that campaign on artists' careers. And uh, the last bit of news I wanted to talk about before I let you go and, and ask you all about your company. Uh, before we go, actually, uh, is uh, talking about the Global Street Day. This is a this is a very uh, uh, it's a breaking news that came out last night. And uh, uh, Billboard, uh, it was at Christmas that reports uh, uh, sources uh, uh, that state that music organizations worldwide are uh, working and are pretty far uh, far on in the uh, process of working on the adoption of a Global Street Date that would see new releases hit the shelves on a Friday uh, everywhere around the world. So the adoption of the Global Street Date would enable labels to fight piracy because, of course, uh, uh, right now. In Australia, releases come out on Friday, and then it's a full three days, essentially before two and a half days, essentially before they come out in the US, and then uh, on a Monday, and right. then they come out on in the UK on a Tuesday, and it sort of seems like uh, uh, this gives the opportunity for people to that really want the release on, on, on the Friday when it comes out in Australia to actually go online and find it because people have uploaded it there. Uh, so uh, an interesting concept, it would probably cause a few issues to distributors and it may have, charts may have to change your catchment area in a sense because uh, uh, in the UK, for example, the chart goes from Sunday to Saturday, I believe. Uh, and so, you know, in that sense, they may have to change it so that it goes from a Friday to Thursday. It would make a lot more sense for new, new artists that want to chart uh, uh, they want to chart high so uh, I don't know what is your take on this uh, uh, do you feel like this would make any difference whatsoever is it long overdue or is it just a, a weird concept this concept Brilliant. is about, uh, this concept is about 15 years too late right. uh, that's my, that's my line I was gonna say 20 yeah <laughs> so definitely something they should have done as soon as things went digital um, so they again need to figure out a day that makes sense if they move it to Friday that's going to confuse a lot of traditional consumers, but right. they, they've got to nail the date on this. And again, they're just really, really late on it. I'm my thing in business is I'm all about doing things that make sense, and this makes sense. So I'm glad we're finally getting together, getting it together, and doing it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and it's an opportunity to fix all the other stupid shit that hasn't been fixed as well. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's Friday is a natural, actually, particularly for physical as well. Tuesday is such an antiquated concept. I, yeah, I, I'm not sure how we got there. Um, but it's it's just frankly absurd. And while they fix that, they should fix the charts. The sound scan charts have no streaming. I mean, it just doesn't. In terms of the you know the Billboard Top 100, Top 200, it doesn't make any sense. Um, they should fix you know pricing issues. And, and as far as piracy, uh, piracy is a non-issue for me, generally speaking. I just don't think it matters anymore. And as streaming services get better and, and more popular. Yeah. To me, I think it just go away. It's yeah. almost a non-issue. Uh, That's kind of what I was thinking as well. You know, it's it's it seems like a lot of work if it's just to fight piracy. I mean, if if it makes sense on on a on another level from a PR perspective and everything else because you can coordinate campaigns better you can you know do worldwide Twitter things reading up to the, to the release and it's gonna be just one date instead of three or four and, and that makes sense from a business perspective but it makes sense from a fan perspective yeah and this is something that Emily mentioned earlier and it's, and it's the the equation that the industry keeps missing and that you know frankly buying a new record or containing or streaming a new record on a Friday night uh, that's much more fun from a fan perspective uh, you can do it socially, you can enjoy it, you can have the weekend to enjoy it rather than a Tuesday when you're struggling to get off work or what have you. Um, so <laughs> yeah. to me, it's, you know, make it Saturday morning. That, that would be fine as well. Yeah, yeah. I think for fans, it's better. It's just more fun. 
Yeah, exactly. And uh, uh, as in terms of news in brief, uh, I want to mention before we go that uh, JoyTunes uh, has uh, collected $5 million in funding. Uh, um, it's an Israeli startup based in Tel Aviv uh, to make it fun to learn to play music. Uh, it's their uh, uh, Series A round. Uh, they've already raised $2 million uh, in, in uh, angel and seed uh, funding. Uh, it started in 2010. I actually interviewed them and beat them a couple of years ago. And uh, they created fantastic apps uh, that allow users to, for example, play the piano and uh, uh, the app picks up uh, what notes they're playing just from the micro uh, microphone on the device uh, rather than having to plug anything into the into the uh, iPhone or the iPad so uh, it's great news from them and uh, also uh, Ofcom in the UK it's a media regulator and it released a new 180 page report uh, last week uh, looking into the country's consumption of media and communications and the report detailed that 30% of 16 to 24 year olds in the UK listen to music through streaming services like Spotify or Deezer while only 24% would choose to switch on the radio of course this is fairly uh, obvious stuff that we would imagine but uh, uh, you know 16 to 24 year olds uh, uh, listen 30 uh, percent of 16 to 24 year olds listen to music from their personal music collection on digital devices such as iPods smartphones or laptops uh, and but things are uh, considerably different uh, when you raise the age uh, bracket and you go into the 25 to 34 year old bracket and they're only four percent surprisingly uh, apparently use uh, streaming services uh, as the, the means to listen to music uh, and uh, yeah, interesting survey, a lot of stuff to read there. Uh, you can find that uh, on uh, the web if you look for the Ofcom uh, report. And uh, that's it. I wanted to ask you, uh, first of all, before we go for a few minutes about your uh, latest projects. So Emily, if you want to start with uh, any of the artists uh, that you're working with, anything that we should be aware of uh, or look out for in terms of releases or campaigns. Sure. Um, well, we started working with Fox Stevenson a few months ago, and he's just been exploding. So that's really, really exciting. He's from Leeds, awesome. and he'll be coming over to the U.S. next month to do a support show at Red Rocks. He'll be at Future of Music, and he has a slew of releases coming up on labels, self-release. Um, it's a really nice strategy that we've put together. Um, I'm, I'm working with a couple other managers on it, and it's, it's really been fantastic. Uh, I mentioned Emmeline Brodsky. She's going to have a record coming out in September. We just shot a music video. I, I was in it, too, in which we're all synchronized swimmers. So nice. we're really pumped about that. And I've been doing a lot of sports management as well because yeah. it's been really fun to take all these tactics and apply it to another field. And that helped us launch. Um, it was actually Justin Kalifowitz and I, who's the president of Downtown Music Publishing. We started a company called Dream Fuel that is crowdfunding for athletes because there was no one really doing it right. And when I brought an, an Olympic gold medalist to Kickstarter to help fund a World Cup tour, they rejected us because they don't work in sports. So right. Doing a ton of music, doing a ton of sports, kind of having no life, but loving all of it. <laughs> That's great. And uh, you were talking about having a UK act. So uh, was that mm -hmm. the first one or did, have you had uh, more before? That's a great question. Um, I don't think I've ever managed anyone from the UK. The reason I'm hesitating is because I, I look at the industry as a global industry. Sure, and, yeah, yeah. you know, I travel internationally all the time. So yeah, yeah. It, it's not really an issue. But, um, I, you know, I think he's really enjoyed working with us. So it's it's been a win. You know, there's, I guess... I'm used to European agents, UK agents, Australian, you know, it doesn't really matter. So um, I, I guess I was wondering if it made box. a difference, of, uh, like, uh, as you said, but it, it doesn't seem like it does at this point. No, it's, not at all. Yeah. Uh, Kevin, on your front, what have you been working on and, uh, and what uh, what should we be looking out for from uh, Girly Action? I think there's two projects that uh, digital music trends listeners might be interested in that I'm working on. The first one is a, um, a photo app called uh, Generate. Um, right. which is available on iOS right now, and I think it's about to pop to Android. I'm consulting with them. What's interesting about this, this is a really creative, um, uh, real-time photo filtering company, but it was built and programmed by people in the creative space rather than programmers trying to be creative. These are creatives being programming, um, and they're really deeply steeped in the music community, uh, the curators, festivals, and the whole bit, and they're, they're really working on creating tools, assets that will be exciting and creative and fun for our musicians. Yeah, um, and that's been a lot of fun doing a lot of outreach and looking for brand ambassadors. And then there's some, I think really interesting things coming from them. Um, the other campaign that's that would probably be interesting is uh, Rob Zombie's new movie Thirty One. We're crowdfunding, running that oh. crowdfunding campaign. And that's all on a platform called Fanback, which is a brand new crowdfunding uh, platform, which is sort of extraordinary on a technical level. They're really, they're, the level of service that they're providing and the level of 
technical uh, bandwidth that they're providing is amazing. We're able to drop a live stream right on the page. So Rob's talking to fans right literally on the page where people can buy. Uh, we're able to communicate through a dashboard in really unique ways and uh, sort of filter all the different backers based on demographics, based on what they purchased and communicate especially with them. So that's been, um, it's a brand new platform. We've been really involved in helping them to develop their platform. Uh, it's been a joy and it's going really well. And, um, you know, Rob is another one of those chief executive artists that really has his shit together. He knows yeah. his fans, he knows the communication that needs to happen and it's, it's a lot of fun. That's awesome. Uh, well, thanks so much again for joining me today. And uh, again, for Emily, it's at Emma Wizzle. Uh, uh, you can find her on whitesmithentertainment.com. Uh, uh, that's right, isn't it? <laughs> yep, you got it. <laughs> Perfect. And uh, for Kevin, it's uh, at Kevin underscore Wartis, or you can find him on uh, girlyaction.com. I, I'm pretty sure I got that right. <laughs> thanks yep. so much again, uh, Emily. Thanks, guys. And thanks, Kevin. And thanks so much for listening to the Digital Music Trends show. You can find it every week on digitalmusictrends.com. Also, don't forget to check out the DMT One to One show. This week, I'm going to have uh, the company Nagual Dance. Uh, they, they are releasing a, a new crowdfunding campaign uh, to uh, create this uh, new uh, game uh, all around uh, uh, the creation of music through movement and, and with the Kinect. Uh, so check that out on digitalmusictrends.com and follow through to the, the links to the one-to-one -one show. Uh, thanks so much for listening. Have a fantastic week and until uh, next time.